Welcome, hello everyone, to episode 71. Today, I'll be moving along in this series in animal physiology by exploring the topic of animal reproduction. Just like plants and fungi, animals can reproduce through a variety of mechanisms. However, where many individual species of plants and fungi can reproduce through asexual and sexual replication, any particular animal species can typically reproduce only through one method. Animal species that can reproduce sexually and asexually are relatively rare. They are a small minority of the branches on this particular meta-branch of the tree of life. But as I'll go on to explain, this is only the beginning of the weirdness that is animal reproduction. As with the analogous episodes for plants and fungi, I'll start with the simplest methods with uh, asexual means of reproduction. Asexual reproduction is, essentially, an organism's ability to clone itself. The offspring shares the same genetic information as the parent, and if the environmental conditions are similar, the offspring will grow up to be a virtually perfect copy of its parent. This reproductive strategy has some benefits, but it also has some downsides. The benefits of asexual reproduction include the ease of replication, because they don't have to find mates, they can just do it by themselves. And this implies the capacity for a single individual to somehow make it to a new environment and single-handedly colonize the whole new area. Some of the downsides of asexual reproduction include relatively low genotypic and phenotypic variety, and thus a vulnerability to diseases and changing environmental conditions. If there's no variation in individual fitness across the population, then when an evolutionary stressor comes in and uh, applies an evolutionary pressure to the population, they don't have that variety to make it so that there's some individuals who happen to survive. They all get wiped out. It's a vulnerability. It's a pretty big one, too. Furthermore, any mutations or gene errors that are generated in an asexual organism will be passed on to its clonal offspring. So mutations in the lineage can accumulate and they'll degrade the fitness of the entire lineage until it eventually dies out. It'll just whimper out to an end as generation after generation gets increasingly less and less fit. They're more and more burdened by all of these accumulated mutations and genetic abnormalities. These risks apply to all asexual organisms, from little tiny bacteria to large macroscopic animals. Asexual reproduction is a simple and primitive means of reproduction, which is one of the many reasons why it's a trait overwhelmingly found in simpler animals, like sea anemones, corals, and hydra. For example, a hydra are more or less uh, detached sea anemones that are able to swim around. It's kind of what they look like. They reproduce asexually through budding. Hydra are small, primitive, nidarian organisms, the sisters of jellyfish, with tube-shaped bodies that are ringed at one end with feeding tentacles. Species in the Hydra genus have a remarkable regenerative capacity, and they don't seem to experience aging. As they live their potentially unending lives, Hydra create buds, which are little projections that grow laterally out of their bodies. These buds extend, forming the body of the offspring. And when it's reached the proper stage of maturity, or ripeness, you could say, it simply breaks off and becomes another free-floating individual. Another asexual method is called fission, which is like an elegant form of fragmentation. The body of the parent literally splits apart to produce two descendants, where a piece breaks off and this new piece regenerates into a whole new mature individual. Animals that can reproduce in this fashion include corals, flatworms, annelids, and starfish. Through the process of archetomy, the animal can split apart from a specific point on its body with no preparation, and each part regenerates missing organs and structures and becomes a new individual. Through the process of peritomy, the animal chemically and physiologically prepares itself to split apart. The split itself occurs like a copy of the organism is getting peeled out of the side of the original. From the point of separation, a second head emerges, and this will pull away laterally to the side of the organism as the rest of the offspring's body is developed. 
All of this grows outward, continually, with the body emerging even more, until it fully splits apart or buds off. Peritomy can be compared to budding, as they're both similar processes, just oriented differently along the body axes. A particularly rare form of asexual reproduction is called parthenogenesis, which is the unfertilized generation of a zygote. In this case, the fetus is generated from an egg produced by mitosis, which doesn't require fertilization. Or it happens by an egg that's produced by meiosis, which then experiences a chromosome duplication. This creates a clone of the mother organism, with no father. This process is relatively rare. It's rare in the animal kingdom, being present in only a few species of fish, reptiles, and invertebrates. However, in the species that can do it, it's not all that rare at all. Some species reproduce this way, as a fluke or a genetic accident, like the zebra finch and the Komodo dragon. While other species reproduce this way as their standard method of reproduction. For example, the Nemetophorus tigris, or the western whiptail, and the Nemetophorus inornatus, or the little striped whiptail, are two very closely related species of lizard living in North America. These species of lizard can interbreed to create a hybrid, and the hybrid is called the Nemetophorus neomexicanus. The hybrids are exclusively female, and they exclusively reproduce through parthenogenesis to produce more clonal females. It's a really amazing aspect of biology that life doesn't just adapt evolutionarily on massive timescales. Life also adapts on a much smaller timescale, where a few generations in a lineage can skip across a genetic gradient and create individuals with radically different reproductive strategies. Another kind of dynamic reproductive response is expressed in crustaceans of the Daphnia genus. These are very small crustaceans, measured in millimeters, which change their reproductive strategy according to the season. In the spring and the summer, they reproduce asexually through parthenogenesis. They generate their clonal daughters in a pouch within their body, but behind their head. It's, it's a strange structural organization because they, these are borderline microscopic organisms. They look very odd. They look like little mobile pouches with hairs and fins and a strange, long, hairy proboscis. Now, later in the year, in the fall, these Daphnia crustaceans alter their reproductive strategy in a way that they can now produce males in addition to females. And so for the Daphnia populations, in the winter months, they begin reproducing sexually. And sexual reproduction allows the generation of a wide amount of genetic diversity, which is very healthy. Research has found that it's not just this changing of the seasons that triggers the shift from asexual to sexual reproduction. Other critical factors are population density and the availability of food. In places where there isn't a lot of other Daphnia, and there's a lot of food, and the days are long and sunny and warm, there isn't a lot of stress on the Daphnia, and so they happily reproduce asexually. However, when they're exposed to stresses and dangers, they begin reproducing sexually so as to generate and preserve genetic diversity and variety that can help the population survive the stressor. For example, in late summer, there's been a population explosion as the newborn Daphnia feed and grow and mature. The water becomes dirtied with wastes and flakes of tissue and detritus, and food begins to run low. Disease and hunger begin to take hold. These pressures, these stressors, prime the Daphnia to begin reproducing sexually, so as to generate diversity in their offspring. The diversity improves the chances that at least some of the offspring might be able to survive the stressor and continue to perpetuate the population, or at the very least, their genetic lineage. Although many animals reproduce asexually, many more, the vast majority, reproduce sexually, with a male and a female generating a fertilized egg. Just like how there's a variety of different ways to reproduce asexually, there's also a variety of different ways to reproduce sexually. There are different variables and strategies that animals use to preserve or maintain a balance between breeding males and females that can optimally perpetuate their species. 
In some species, if members of a particular sex aren't available to reproduce, some individuals can change their sex to fill the gap, like in mushroom corals. In other species, a shift in the social hierarchy can cause a sex change, like in the case of clownfish. The clownfish social hierarchy is dominated by a female, and there's a lot of male and female underlings. But after the dominant female dies, she gets replaced by the largest male, but only after he turns into a female. In wrasse fish, the process is relatively similar, except it works in an opposite direction. The social hierarchy in the wrasse fish has a male dominating a large group of breeding females. And when the male dies, the largest, most aggressive and dominant female turns into a male and takes his place as the leader of the group of breeding females. Just as with plants, and with some sex-analogous mating types of fungi, the animal sexes, male and female, possess corresponding types of gametes and specialized reproductive structures that are called gonads. The male possesses gonads called testes, which generate the sperm while the female possesses gonads called ovaries, which produce the eggs. Both the ovaries and the testes are housed inside their own specialized reproductive structures, corresponding to the individual's sex, which is determined by genetic and hormonal processes that take root during gestation. Right now, it's time to explore how these gametes are made through the process of gametogenesis, or more specifically, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Spermatogenesis is the formation of sperm, which in mammals begins with a diploid cell found in the testes called a spermatogonium. This spermatogonium is like any other typical diploid cell. It can reproduce through mitosis to produce more spermatogonium cells. But it can also produce specialized offspring cells called primary spermatocytes. Now these cells are also diploid, but they quickly undergo the meiosis I process to produce two secondary spermatocytes, each of them being haploid, with a single copy of the chromosome. These secondary spermatocytes, half the size of their parent cell, will then undergo meiosis II, and they each produce two even smaller haploid cells called spermatids. So the original cell is a large diploid spermatogonium, and it produces a daughter cell that undergoes two rounds of meiosis where it's turned into four smaller haploid spermatid cells. These spermatid cells then undergo a short development process. The nucleus of the spermatid gets positioned in the forming head region, and behind this forms the neck and the midpiece. The neck contains a centriole, which is involved in healthy fertilization, and the midpiece is stuffed with mitochondria. All of these mitochondria produce the ATP that are required to move and power the tail which is a single, massive flagellum that grows out and then whips around to propel the spermatid head through the water, or the semen fluid, or whatever combination of internal body fluids would exist inside the uterus. After all of this development, these now become the mature sperm that can be released to fertilize an egg. Now the egg is generated through oogenesis, which is a little more nuanced than spermatogenesis. It begins with a diploid cell in the ovary called oogonias, which undergo mitosis to produce a primary oocyte. This first part is very analogous to spermatogenesis, but after this, things start getting different. The primary oocyte, uh, one of the daughter cells of the oogonia, will undergo meiosis I to produce haploid daughter cells. But these two daughter cells aren't identical. One daughter cell is called the secondary oocyte, and it looks similar to its parent cell, but it's just a little smaller. The other daughter cell is called a polar body. This cell is given hardly any cytoplasm, so it's really tiny, and everything in there is densely packed. Because it's small, but packed with a copy of the chromosome, it's negatively charged, or it, it's polar, and so it's called a polar body, just a mass of negatively charged proteins and nucleic acids. Both the secondary oocyte and the polar body will each undergo meiosis II. The secondary oocyte produces a single ootid, which will mature into an ovum, or a mature egg cell, that's ready to be fertilized by a sperm cell. 
Now, in addition to the UTID, the secondary oocyte also produces another polar body. Now, the first polar body that was created a generation previously, that will also undergo the stages of meiosis too. But this will just produce two more polar bodies. So, spermatogenesis starts with one cell and produces four sperm cells, while eugenesis starts with one cell and produces four cells, but only one of these four cells is a fertile egg. And the other three are tiny polar bodies that will just decay and fall apart shortly after they're created. The egg is a critically valuable cell because it's literally the seed from which a new animal grows into an embryo, and the embryo grows into a fully viable individual. The process by which the embryo is developed is called gestation, and this involves the embryo being stored somewhere, in some kind of capsule or container, where they have an access of nutrients. The nutrients in the egg are the first nutrients consumed by the new individual, and so they have to last long enough to ensure proper development through gestation. In species that lay their eggs outside their bodies, like birds and reptiles, the egg will contain a yolk, which is a fatty, protein-rich layer that nourishes the developing embryo. Now, in animals that gestate their offspring internally, the egg doesn't need a yolk, as nutrients are actively shared with the offspring through the placenta, which is like an interface between the embryo and the mother's vascular system. What kind of structure the egg has largely depends on the species in question, and the methods and the strategies they use to reproduce. The first choice in strategies is how to fertilize the eggs. Some animals, like mammals, use internal fertilization, where the eggs are held internally by the female, and the male will deposit sperm into her body to fertilize the eggs. Other animals, like many species of fish, use external fertilization, where the eggs are released by the female into the surrounding water, and the male attempts to fertilize the eggs by spraying or releasing a cloud of sperm into the water as well. External fertilization is almost exclusively found in marine species, you know, water-based habitats, because a water solution is ideal for the three-dimensional spread of sperm so as to maximize their contact with the released eggs. Furthermore, this external fertilization technique is a relatively messy way to reproduce. The animals that use external reproduction will generate a huge amount of gametes, eggs and sperm, and this is something that you might expect from an evolutionary perspective. Because these animals are literally releasing their gametes into the environment, into the raw, exposed environment, in the hope that sperm and egg will meet. And it will greatly improve their odds of fertilization if there's hundreds of thousands, or even hundreds of millions of gametes released at once. In contrast, animals that use internal fertilization will generate and then release a much smaller number of gametes at a given time. This reproductive strategy is much more targeted and much less messy, so it doesn't require that nearly as much energy and resources be invested in gamete production. In internal fertilization, the female animal is holding the unfertilized eggs within her body, within her sexual organs, her ovaries, which are then held inside the uterus, which is above the vagina and the sperm has to be brought into the female's reproductive structures in order to fertilize the eggs. Now, there's two general strategies here, and I'm willing to bet that you're much more familiar with the first strategy than you are with the second. In the first strategy, the male possesses a penis, which is like a sperm injector. The penis is inserted into the vagina, and after a brief period of mechanical stimulation, the male releases sperm into the female. The second strategy is a little more exotic, and while most species of salamander do this, it's a strategy that's mostly seen in invertebrate species, like giant squids, butterflies, and other insects. The male releases his sperm, but not directly into the female's body. Instead, the male will package the sperm up into a literal mass or a globule called a sperm ampulla, or a spermatophore. These are composed of both sperm and drool, or regurgitated gunk, and so they look like slimy white balls, or strands, or some kind of gooey mass that gets left behind on the ground, or on some low-hanging leaves. 
The female will smell or somehow detect the spermatophore, and she'll move over to it and insert it into the vagina or the cloaca, whichever organ is present that leads to the reproductive organs and the eggs. In some species, the female will actually eat the ampulla, and as she eats it for its nutrients, she's also ingesting sperm, and the sperm will travel down her digestive tract to her reproductive organs. This second strategy with the ampulla, it's really odd, because it's technically internal fertilization where the parents may never actually meet each other. Anyways, once sperm is inside the female's reproductive organs, the sperm will follow chemical cues to find and race towards the eggs. Because multiple males can deposit sperm into the same female, it's quite possible for a female animal to be carrying the sperm from multiple males inside her at once. The sperm from one male will literally compete on a chemical and cellular level with all of the sperm from all of the other males. And this has some really interesting evolutionary consequences. Now, most obviously, healthier sperm will generally be able to swim faster. It will be able to expend more energy for longer durations. And it will be less vulnerable to the dangerous, acidic conditions of the vagina and the immune response of the female. This generally healthier sperm, from a presumably healthier male, will be more likely to find and fertilize the egg. However, it's been discovered that the second male to deposit sperm is actually far more likely to fertilize the female than the first male is. This effect is called the second male advantage. Incoming ejaculate is able to physically push out the fluid deposited by the earlier male. There are numerous species, from insects to humans, that have evolved a penis with a flared tip. During the rhythmic motions of intercourse, the flared tip of the penis produces a suction or a sweeping effect that can dislodge and pull out the previously deposited sperm of other males. In species where the female regularly mates with multiple males before fertilization, the males tend to grow larger testes and produce larger quantities of sperm. This is believed to be a compensatory factor for sperm competition where the general solution is to simply create and send in more competitors to improve the chances that one of them will be the first to find and fertilize the egg. One of the really interesting consequences of sperm competition is that it takes evolutionary fitness and ecological competition and compacts it down to the scale of cells and chemicals. It's no accident, then, that sperm competition also happens most often in social species that live in groups which would naturally facilitate the female having ready access to multiple males in short succession. The neat thing here is that virtually all of the males get a chance at mating, but fitness is preserved because competition exists among the sperm, which generally represent the health and the vitality of the male who produced it, or at least some advantageous traits in the male's sperm that really help it. The males themselves, as macroscopic individual organisms, don't have to necessarily concern themselves too much with competition among each other, and this facilitates cooperative, constructive, and pro-social behavior. So most or all of the males get a chance to experience mating, and they get the perception that they've successfully reproduced, even if their sperm aren't the ones that ultimately end up fertilizing the female. But they aren't aware of that. They aren't aware of what happens on a chemical level. So the energy that they'd spend competing for mates is now freed up to spend cooperating and helping the group. It should be clarified that the female isn't a passive witness to all of this. In many species, the female displays a remarkable control over who fertilizes her eggs. Some females can store sperm from desirable males for a long period of time. They wait until external conditions like the season and the temperature and the humidity are optimal for producing offspring. And when that time comes, the female can tap into this stored sperm to fertilize her eggs. They can do this even if the particular mating event where they got that sperm from that particular desirable male, even if that mating event happened a long time ago. This offers a degree of stability and defense in the female's life in the face of the wilderness only offering her chance opportunities here or there that you can't rely on. Furthermore, in many species, females can also deliberately or chemically reject sperm from undesirable males. You can kind of think of this like some guy in a dance club who's making a scene 
who gets thrown out onto the street by the bouncer. In some species, the female animal will deliberately choose which male gets to be the last to mate with her before fertilization, which is a strategy that she uses that exploits the second male advantage. The female will have her preferred male, the desired male, copulate with her last in a given succession of males, so as to give his sperm the edge in the sperm competitions, the best chance to fertilize her eggs. When fertilization actually occurs, the fused egg and sperm become an embryo. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned how some species have eggs that have yolks, and the embryo feeds off the yolk. Now this is the case for oviparous species, where the embryo is grown inside an enclosed sac called an egg. Eggs like this are specialized for the environment in which the animal lives. Reptile eggs are typically soft-shelled and require a dark, moist environment, or at least they need to be buried underground, away from predators and the harsh, drying light of the sun. Birds' eggs, on the other hand, are coated in a hard shell, which offers mechanical protection, and they're dotted with thousands of small pores that allow for gas exchange between the embryo inside the egg and the outside environment. Yolks also exist in the eggs of ovoviviparous animal species, which produce embryos and eggs that are retained inside the body. The yolk feeds the embryo, not the mother. In contrast, the embryos of viviparous animals don't have yolks, because the embryo is retained within the mother's body, and the mother feeds the embryo with nutrients that are derived from her own bloodstream. The period of the female's life where she is carrying one or more embryos within her body, either before laying the eggs or before giving live birth, is called pregnancy, or more technically, it's the period of gestation. Pregnancy is a radical change in the female's morphology. In humans, the uterus can expand to 500 times its normal size. The breasts swell as milk is produced to feed the incoming newborn. Nausea and disorientation may be frequent, as the growing fetus pushes against and displaces other internal organs. It's an intense process, and it takes a huge toll on the mother's body. The chemical resources that are required to produce a healthy offspring, it's tremendous. And because of this, the amount of attention and care that a mother can invest into her offspring is directly negatively correlated with the number of offspring that she has. This is true for pretty much all animals, not just viviparous animals, and it's understood as the RK selection theory. This theory posits that fundamentally, there are trade-offs between the quality and the quantity of an offspring that an animal can produce, and the strategies that an animal uses to produce offspring puts it somewhere on a gradient between being R and K selected. Animal species that are R-selected utilize a reproductive strategy that prefers quantity over quality. R-selected species produce a huge amount of offspring in a single litter. They have relatively small bodies that grow to maturity quickly, and they have very short generation times, meaning that offspring can reproduce on their own relatively shortly after being born, you know, within maybe a couple months or a couple weeks. Despite this capacity for rapid reproduction, they have short lifespans, and many individuals will die before they get the chance to reproduce. They don't invest that much attention or resources into their offspring, as they usually lay the eggs, bury them, or hide them, and then just leave. These are all traits that would be favored by animals that are living in a dynamic, often changing environment, where rapid reproductive rates contribute to a greater evolutionary plasticity and thus a greater ability to quickly react and adapt to stressors and changes in the environment. Our selected animals include many species of insects, many species of fish, and pretty much all rodents, in addition to many other mammals. These organisms also exist in ecological niches where food is, more or less, unlimited. From the perspective of an ant, there is almost endless leaves in the jungle. From the perspective of a, of a tiny shrew living in the forest, there is almost endless seeds and leaves for it to chew on. This is to say that they, they exist in, an, in a level of the ecological niche 
where resources for them are borderline infinite. They just, they just have this massive geographic space that they can spread across. Even though our selected animals reproduce quickly and have huge populations, they may not feel the effects of crowding, as there's usually more than enough available food for quite a few of them. Our selected species are described as opportunistic, because they find and exploit any niche or habitat that they can. This trait, combined with their rapid reproductive rates, leads to relatively fast bursts of divergence and speciation. Where it appears that our selected species generally believe that quantity has a quality all its own, the K-selected species are much more focused on actual quality. Elephants, for example, are a K-selected species. Bears tend to be K-selected species. Humans are a K-selected species. What this means is that K-selected species have a relatively small number of offspring, usually just one or two at a time, maybe three, but they invest a huge amount of resources, both material and emotional, into raising them. K-selected animal species, like elephants or bears or humans, they tend to have longer periods of development and maturation, longer generations, longer lifespans, and larger body sizes. On an ecological level, K-selected species are optimized for stable environments, where they have to compete for scarce resources to sustain both their relatively massive bodies and their populations. K-selected animals typically live in populations that grow to and hover around the carrying capacity of their habitat. Because of this, the K-selected species tend to be vulnerable to massive or sustained changes in their environment, where the carrying capacity gets thrown out of whack or highly disturbed. Anything that pushes them out of equilibrium, like the loss of a predator or the loss of a food source, will put them at risk. And because of their relatively slow reproductive rate and longer generation time, the K-selected species have a longer, more fragile evolutionary road to recovery. Alright, so where was I? I think I went down this train of thought when I was talking about the point of fertilization. So fertilization occurs when sperm meets egg. Fertilization creates an embryo. And the embryo develops, at least in viviparous animals, within the mother during pregnancy. As I said, pregnancy involves radical changes to the female's body, as it stretches and adjusts to accommodate the growing embryo. The mother will produce more blood, and her blood vessels will dilate to hold it all, and the heart increases in size and beats faster, which all helps the mother support and feed the growth of the fetus. In some species, the combined mother-fetus circulatory system uses countercurrent flow of maternal and fetal blood, so as to set up and maintain concentration gradients that enable a continuous flow of oxygen and nutrients into the offspring without actually mixing blood. Humans don't have this. Instead, we use a surface area-based method similar to what exists in our small intestine. Maternal blood in the placenta washes over little protrusions, called villi, which are packed with fetal blood vessels. Diffusion carries nutrients from the mother's blood across this membrane or this organic structure into the fetus's blood, much like how nutrients from the chyme are absorbed by the small intestine. A downside to having a uh, particularly intimately connected mother-fetus circulatory network is that any poisons or dangerous chemicals ingested by the mother will be shared with her fetus. In the wilderness, this can be dangerous for a pregnant animal that eats something it shouldn't like a poisonous mushroom, or a dart frog, or if the mother gets infected with a blood parasite, or gets bitten by a venomous animal, or, or contracts some kind of disease. In humans, a huge problem we see from this is fetal alcohol syndrome, where the pregnant mother consumes alcohol, which gets strained through the placenta and goes into her fetus, where it then causes brain damage and developmental abnormalities. Now, on a more positive note, uh, in a healthy development, as the fetus reaches viability and continues developing to term, the viviparous animal mother will eventually give birth. This is the moment wherein the mother's body dilates the birth canal, and the fully formed fetus gets pushed out into the world to open its eyes and take its first breath of air. 
In oviparous animals, the embryo will develop in the egg until it reaches its point of complete development, after which the fetus will physically break or rip out of the egg. Reptiles can break out relatively easily, as their eggshells are soft, and they come equipped with claws and fangs. In contrast, birds have to break out of a hard shell, and so they've evolved a structure called an egg tooth, or a small point, or a little horn that exists on the tip of their beak that they use to hammer at and break open their egg. Once the offspring has been born, however it happens, it is now a fully-fledged, physiologically autonomous individual, beginning its life in the infant stage. In species where the parent drops the eggs off and leaves, they spend no time with their offspring and they'll only meet them in the wilderness in person by sheer coincidence. Species of sea turtles, for example, will lay their eggs under a layer of sand on a beach, and then they'll return to the ocean and swim away, and the baby turtles will hatch sometime later, and live their lives without any guidance from their parents. Other animals, such as your typical K-selected viviparous mammal, will continue to raise the infant as it ages teaching it, protecting it, and feeding it, until it reaches a point of maturation where it leaves the roost and goes out to live on its own, to live its own life and find its own mates so as to reproduce and create offspring of its own. And that is the process of animal reproduction. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and uh, I hope you found it fun and interesting. This is one of those topics that I think is really neat because it it hits us so close to home. It's so intimate. It's one thing to talk about plant reproduction or fungal reproduction because there's quite a few degrees of separation there. But when you start talking about animal reproduction, you start talking about things that are directly involved with or are literally are human reproduction. And things start to get really weird and really crazy really fast. If you want to learn more about human reproduction, then just sit tight, because I have a future episode planned in a greater series on human existence that will cover this exact topic. But as for today's episode, that's about it. Give it a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and consider supporting the podcast through Patreon, or by buying a kick-ass t-shirt at the official store. I draw those designs myself, you know? And as always, thanks for listening. to support the biologic podcast it's super easy when you open a new episode press the like button or share it with your friends if you aren't subscribed you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week you can also peruse our official store which has a ton of cool stuff like hand designed t-shirts hoodies and stickers all the links you need are in the description section below 